Good morning to uh, one and all, those of us that are here in the sanctuary on this bright, uh, sunny Sabbath day. I want to thank the Lord for bringing us safely through another week and bringing us into this physical sanctuary, but more importantly, this sanctuary of time is holy and, and blessed Sabbath day. We thank those of you that are listening online that as we share today that we all would be blessed, those of us that are here and those that are on internet land. As I come before you uh, today, I come by the, 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 the grace of God and to share with you what he has laid on my heart to share with us as we've been sharing for the past several weeks on the issue of the Sabbath. We've talked about the, the Sabbath in creation and the Sabbath and the prophets and Jesus and the Sabbath and the Sabbath and the law. We talked about the change of, of, of Sabbath from the first day, from the seventh day uh, of the week to the first, I would say the attempted change uh, because no one could change God's law. And then last week we looked at the fact that God who knows the beginning from the end, that he knew that this time would come when men would attempt to not only trample upon his law but to, but to change his law. And we pointed out to the entity that the Bible prophesied that would change it and we saw that exactly that was uh, fulfilled in the historical record. And we, as we come today, I want to talk about the history the, about America and the Sabbath. You know, there are theologians and ministers and preachers and prophets, they continue to, to insist that America is not in Bible prophecy. But I pray that by God's grace as we share today, that we will not only discover America, the United States of America in the biblical record, but we would also show from the Bible that she is verily, verily fulfilling her prophetic role in the drama of the ages. Jesus is very precious to us and this is why he has called us to come together, not only come together on his Sabbath, but to learn more of him, to learn the prophetic truths that points to his second coming. So as we share these lessons on the Sabbath, it's not just to share the lessons to give us some information on the Sabbath, but it is to lift up Jesus Christ and to show that he was not only gracious to, to give us the insight to know of the things that would happen, that he was not only loving to, to give us his law, which includes his Sabbath, but to inform us and to let us know that the time will come when men would would trample on his law and turn away from his law. It used to be to a great extent that men would, for the most part, just trample on, uh, on, uh, on one of those precepts, the Sabbath, a uh, uh, commandment. But what we're realizing is that time moves on. Men are ripping away. Men are trampling upon more and more of God's commandment. We, look at the condition of the world today with abortion. The Bible says thou shalt not kill, but yet men have institutionalized the killing of innocent babies. Thou shalt not kill. That has been cast aside. We see in the LGBTQI and they keep adding letters, but I simply call it what the American Psychological Association used to call it a mental illness. God calls it an abomination. Man with man and woman with woman. And Jesus says that 
as we come to the close of Earth's history and we see these things, know that Jesus is at the door. In the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20, he told his disciples when he was answering them with regards to what would happen in Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, he told them to be sure that your flight would not be in the winter or on the Sabbath day. If Jesus had wanted to do away with his Sabbath day, he would not have uttered those words, and so we are today. As we move on to part eight of our hopefully 15-part series on the Sabbath, and today's message, today's lesson is America, America and the Sabbath. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you once again for bringing us safely through another week. We thank you for bringing us safely through the night as we lay down on our pillows and we fell asleep. There was no guarantee that we'll be able to make it up this morning because many, many on this planet did go to bed last night and didn't wake up uh, this morning. And so we want to thank you for giving us another day in the land of the living. And dear Father, we want to utilize this time that you have given us. We want to use it wisely. May everything that we do with the time that you have given to us, may it always be, Father, something that benefit our fellow man, because that's why we're here is to be of service is to be of benefit to our fellow man and more importantly to glorify you to praise you and to represent you to a doomed and dying world be with your manservant in a very special way this morning as i share from your word the truths of your sabbath as it relates to this time in which we live and this country in which we live. May you bless us. May you bless the listeners. Dear Father, may the words that are spoken, may they find listening ears and receptive hearts. And may lives be changed as a result of not what this humble piece of clay says, but what your word says. May it bring conviction to their hearts that someone may come into knowledge of you, who you are, your Savior, and that they, their Father, will purpose in their hearts to keep all of your commandments, including the Sabbath commandment. Is my prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. My dear brothers and sisters, just this uh, past week, July 4th week, uh, uh, celebrated, we celebrated Independence Day. And it is basically Independence Day as we celebrate uh, Independence Day. We reflect back on the birth of this nation, at least so far as the official historical records show. And we're not here to debate any of the, the issues that we faced as a nation beginning back then even on to this very day, but we're here to, to look at the prophetic record as the God who knows the end from the beginning shares with us the part that this country in which we live, some of you are listening from different parts of the world, we're here in America. We want to share with you what the Bible has prophesied, and you be the judge if what is happening in this country today is not precisely as what the Bible prophesied. In previous weeks, I'm not going to go into detail, but give us a, a summary. We looked at the book of Daniel. As Daniel had this dream of these four beasts, the beast of the lion, which represented the uh, Babylonian empire in which he lived, and then the beast of the, the, the bear, representing the Medo-Persians that captured the Babylonian Empire and then the vision of the leopard 
and that represents Alexander the Great, that, that young, astute military leader that conquered not only Major Persia, but the then known world. And then we moved on and we talked about this nondescript beast which resembled nothing like we see in nature. And the work that that beast would do, it would conquer even more territory than Alexander the Great and rule with a strong arm. The Bible says that he trampled with his feet of iron. And we recognize that to be none other than the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire. And history testified to that which was prophesied hundreds of years ago. Always remember that prophecy is foretelling history. And history is the fulfillment of prophecy. So as God prophesied through his servant, we see exactly that what has come to pass. And then out of that, what the, is generally called a nondescript beast, because it doesn't remember anything that resembles, rather, anything in, in nature, we see the Bible talks about another beast, a little horn, the Bible refu uh, uh, refers to it. And that little horn, as we uh, have discussed in previous uh, presentations, was none other than the papal power, the Roman Catholic uh, papacy, and I want to emphasize here again, I'm not talking about individuals. Maybe I'm speaking for them. I know that I'm speaking for them. Because they're worshiping God according to all that they knew. They're, they're innocent. They, this is all that they've known. No, I'm not talking about those tens of millions of people who sincerely love God in their hearts. I'm talking about the hierarchy, a system, which the Bible predicts that would have that would have a very important part to play in his plan of salvation, a part of opposing him. We show that they're the ones, just as the Bible prophesied, are the ones that attempted to change God's law. And then John, in the book of Revelation chapter 13, as he talks about this power from Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10, and then he concludes in verse 10 with regards to this power. He says, he that leadeth into captivity, because that's what it did. It held in oppression and captivity the people of the world. Those that were part of the system and, oh yes, even a, a worse fate for those that are not. History testified to the, 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 the cruelty and barbarism with which this entity dealt with the people of the earth for no other reason than wanting to think for themselves and even more importantly, wanting to accept Jesus Christ as the only savior of the world, the only means to salvation. And so now, John having given us a, a history of this power, he says that he that leadeth into captivity, referring to the papal power, shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Talking about this power, this organization. And then John says, here is the patience and faith of the saints. And what John is talking about is that despite the cruelty and the persecution that was meted out to God's people, there were those that persevered because of their faith in Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, let us go back a little bit in history as we seek to discover American in Bible prophecy and the part that she would play in a very specific way with respect to God's Sabbath. Let's go back to the year 1798. The French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte of France became utterly uh, disgusted with the domination of the church, this very power 
because as I just outlined, she was just about ruling uh, 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 the nations. And Napoleon just grew utterly disgusted with the power of the church and coupled that with his determination to, to capture the world, he sent his most able general, Aberthier, into the city of Rome with the specific purpose of overturning, if you will, the papal power. The then ruling Pope, Pope Pius VI, was literally taken off of his throne. This is history, my dear brothers and sisters. It's basically fulfilling what the Bible predicted. Took him off his throne and took him to Valence, France, where the Pope died in the year 1799. In effect, what Napoleon accomplished was the taking away of the political power, the power of the papacy over the states, and declaring it to be a religion only, a religion only. But the Bible tells us that in the book of Revelation 13 and verse 3, Holy Spirit, help me as I share your word today. It says, and I saw one of his heads as it was wounded unto death, and his deadly wound was healed, and the whole world wandered after the beast. If you check the historical record, the historians were saying, well, that is the end of the papal power. But the Bible says that he would be wounded. What is the wound that was inflicted? The wound was inflicted by Napoleon as he separated the temporal power from the ecclesiastical or religious power. And that is what constituted the wound. And we would see, I will share with you in a minute, that the very words of scripture were quoted when the unification of the church, the Roman church and the state was once again united. You see exactly had the Bible had predicted of the healing of the wound. It began in the year 1929. My dear brothers and sisters, we just don't serve a pie in the sky God. He is intimately involved in each of our lives and he is involved in the movements of the nations and we have been showing this and will continue to, to show today. In the year 1929, there was a man by the name of Benito Mussolini. And he was the prime minister of, of, of Italy. He was a, what you call a fascist. <laughs> and what is a fascist? A fascist is a, a ruler which seeks to, to dominate the people, take away their power of choice, take away their power of thinking. And whatever that fascist says, that's the law of the land. And anyone that thinks or acts in any way against what that leader says would suffer some severe penalties, including death, torture, and death. You see, Mussolini was also a son of the church. And in the year 1929, Mussolini signed what they call a contardat, or a treaty, if you will, with the then ruling Pope Pius XI, thus restoring the temporal or political power to the church, wounding, bringing back the healing, or at least the begin of the healing of the wound. It is known as the Lateran Treaty, and it was signed in the Lateran Cathedral. And so, my dear, on the year 1929, February 11th, as a matter of fact, to be exact. Now here I want to share with you what the secular press says about this event, about Mussolini signing this agreement, this compact with the papal power. The Associated Press reported the event, it says, Mussolini and Gaspari 
signed a historical Roman pact and healed the wound, healed the wound of many years. What did the Bible say? That the deadly wound would be healed. And so we see here in 1929, let me give you another new source, the San Francisco Chronicle reported the next day on February 12th, 1929. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, the Lateran Atrini, the he healing the wound, which was forth festered since 1870, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. So the Bible, we could trust the Bible because it is given to us by a God who knows the future. And the future says that the, the beast would be wounded, would receive the deadly wound, but the deadly wound would be healed. And when you receive a wound and, and it's treated, it doesn't heal all of it at one time. So what happened in the Lateran Treaty began to heal the world. I want to ask you a question this morning. Is, every, is the whole world wandering after the beast? If you reflect back on other messages that I have shared, we see where princesses and, and prime ministers and presidents, they're all bowing down to the, to the Pope. I'll never forget the picture when Pope John Paul II died and you had three American presidents bowing down at the coffin of a dead pope. We see the whole world, all the nations, he, he's involved with, and he's, uh, he's the engine, if you will. The power behind this whole climate change issue, I'm not denying that there may be climate change issues, but it is being ruled, but it is being used to call the entire world back under the power of the papacy. My dear brothers and sisters, the papacy since 1929 has grown gradually but steadily as it sets out to regain its lost position of world leadership. Just as the Bible says, her deadly wound would be healed and all the world would wander after the beast. It's breathtakingly remarkable, my dear brothers and sisters, with no reference to Bible prophecy that the, uh, and the very words of scripture that the words that was used to sign that agreement were the very words that was used by scripture. My dear brothers and sisters, since that time, the papacy has grown rapidly into a dominant political world power. Her religious influence is, is felt around every corner of the world. No one can deny the power of this behemoth, a universal mixture of religion and political power. Why did I say so much about that power? Because we want to build our case as any good attorney goes into court before he makes his point, he gives all the evidence. He gives all the evidence, the proof of what he is trying to prove. And so it is with God, and I want to follow in his footsteps. And so now that we have talked about the beast that, that came before America, let's look at what the Bible says. The Bible now goes on to say, in the book of, uh, of Revelation, and Revelation chapter 13, we just looked at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10 that talked about the papal power and we talked about that before and we're making the connection now as to what happened just about that time that that wound was healed, that, uh, that it received that wound. In the book of Revelation chapter 13, the Bible says, and I stood upon uh, uh, the uh, uh, verse 11, I'm sorry. And I beheld, and I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And then he spake like a dragon. 
You see, my dear brothers and sisters, what the Bible is telling us is just at the time that the papacy seemed to be going down, John the Revelator now sees another nation coming up. This nation, the Bible predicts, as we will see, would grow into a worldwide power. Because remember now, beginning going back as we share the history from Babylon, all those nations that we talked about, Babylon, Medo Persia, uh, Greece, Papal Rome, Pagan Rome, the one thing that they have in common is that they all have paid, played a part, a significant part in God's plan of salvation for human souls. And so the Bible tells us that this nation, it's a young nation, it's a lamb-like nation, and it had two horns, the Bible says. So in addition to its, its youthfulness, it's now coming up, in addition to its seemingly Christian character, like a lamb, who is the lamb in, in the Bible? My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us, John declared, when Jesus would baptize, he says, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so John describes this nation as having some Christian uh, characteristics as a lamb. The Bible tells us that it had two horns. What do these two horns represent? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3 and verse 4, what is meant by horns. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. So the Bible is telling us that this nation that rises up or is rising up just at the time that the papacy is going down, that its power lies in its two horns. It's not two nations. It's one beast, one nation with two horns, the source of its power. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, the two horns represent the foundational pillars and power of this nation that was coming up. When we consider the events, my dear brothers and sisters, that give birth to the United States of America, there could be no other nation on planet Earth that the Bible could be talking about and which history testifies to. The accuracy of God's prophetic word is undeniable accurate, is undeniably accurate and fascinating. You see, the struggle for the American colonies for independence began about 1775 on July 4th, 1776. The Declaration of Independence was signed. We're celebrating the 248th year of uh, uh, this year. Uh, the founding fathers declared America to be an independent nation from the mother country of England. In 1777, the Articles of Confederation was adopted. In 1787, the U.S. Constitution was framed. On July 26, 1788, it was ratified by the original 13 states. On the 1st of March, 1789, the U.S. Constitution went into effect. As this was going on, what was happening with the papacy? She lost or was seemingly losing her power, at least her temporal power. The United States is the only nation, my dear brothers and sisters, that fits the description of this, of this country, of this nation that would arise out after, rather, the seemingly demise of, uh, of, of the papacy. And those horns, what those two horns represent, is the citadel of America's power. The Constitution of the United States, the First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law 
respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You see this new nation, it would be diametrically opposite to the one that came before it, which was a unification of church and state. This nation is different. The First Amendment tells us that Congress shall make no law with respect to the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of press, or of the right of the people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for grief for the redress of grievances. That was the idea. But the Bible says that this lamb-like beast with two horns would one day speak like a dragon. Those two horns represent the power of America. On one hand or one of the horns is the guarantee of freedom of religion. You free to worship whoever you want, when you want to worship, how you want to worship without the interference of the government. Power number one, religious freedom, religious liberty, Protestantism. You see those that fled Europe that came to this country, they were fleeing from the church state union, both in England and all of Europe, in England, and yes, the papal colonies also. The other horn is equally powerful and unquestionably idealistic as it were for the time. It was a new, a new period of time in our history when this country arose. On one hand, freedom of religion, freedom to worship. On the other hand, a representative government, a government for the people, of the people, and by the people, a concept in which the majority rules with respect for minority rights. And so the Bible predicted that this power would arise. When we looked at the time that it arose and began to come into power, when we looked at the, at the general principles and, and characteristics, the nature, if you will, of its founding documents, we see that there is no other nation on planet Earth that fits that description, the revolutionary concepts that were embedded in the founding documents. And yes, I recognize that the, the, um, the practice did not always and has not always uh, 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 lived up to the precepts. I understand that. I know that. But God is just giving us the broad picture of the, of, of the nations that would come and rule the earth until the second coming of Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, but the Bible says that this lamb-like beast would behave like a dragon. Who is the dragon? The Bible tells us very clearly in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 9, and that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels, were cast out uh, or with him. Jesus says that Satan is the prince of this world and he has no part in him. And he wants him to have no part in us. And the only way that we, he would have no part in us is if we give our lives uh, completely and totally to the Lamb, Christ Jesus. The Bible continues in Revelation 13 and verse 3. We, we're talking about the nation becoming a dragon. What is the Bible talking about? In Revelation 13 and verse 3, again talking about the papal power, here is what the Bible says in verse 2. And the beast which I saw, if you read the previous verses, it is talking about this beast that looked like a leopard, a lamb, and a bear. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, help us, Father, 
And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and authority. And I'm going to, be, have you already read verse 3, where it would lose his power? The deadly wound, and then the deadly wound would be healed. And moving on to verse 4 in Revelation, we pinpoint in America in Bible prophecy and the work that she would do. My dear brothers and sisters, in verse 4 of Revelation 13, the Bible says, and they worshipped the dragon, the whole world that is wandering after the beast, who gets its power from the dragon. That's what the Bible says. Is there any surprise why tens of millions of people were killed because they wanted to read the Bible and go by the Bible? Because the Bible not only prophesies of these nations, but exposes the wickedness of the man of sin. And so there's no, no way that we could have the people being educated in the Bible, because if they are, then they'll come to know truly who we are and truly what the part that we play and will play in this earth's history. The dragon, the enemy, wants to keep it secret. In verse 4, the Bible says, And they worship the dragon, which gave his power to the beast. Here again, the Bible is saying that the papal power, the papal entity, yes, my dear brothers and sisters, it's not politically correct, but it's Bible truth. And by God's grace, by God's grace, I want to choose the truth of the Bible against, man, against man's tradition and politically, uh, and political correct uh, 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 concepts and ideas. And the Bible says that this entity gets its power from the dragon and they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with her? And at that point, my dear brothers and sisters, it now appears that this beast that was wounded and all the world is wondering after the beast because now John is asking in amazement, who is able, who is able, come on in my brother, to make war with her? Who could fight against her? Because John sees her power. Her power now united with all the powers in the earth, primarily the United States of America. John is saying that Oh, this is so powerful. Who is going to be able to stand? But I want to praise God, the God of heaven, because he does not leave us in fear or in suspense. And he says in verse 8, And all, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the dragon, through the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain, from the foundation of the world. In other words, God would have a people. Amen. Even though the entire world is wandering after the beast, even though the beast in, 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 in collusion, if you will, with the powerful nations of the world, primarily America, the Bible says that God would have a people with all the odds against them they would stand for him. When this worldwide universal uh, 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 amalgamation of church and state powers is instituting laws to say that we should honor the beast by honoring Sunday, the Bible says that his people would be saying, remember, I remember the Sabbath and the Lord told me to keep it holy, so I'm going to stand on God's side. You see, one with God, it's always a majority. Always a majority. And how are we with God? We're with God by keeping his commandments. That's what he requires. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. My dear brothers and sisters in Revelation 13, moving on, the Bible says that and he, the lamb-like beast, exercised all the power of the first beast before him. Remember what we just read? That he would speak like a dragon? 
Did we also read in the Bible that this power that came before the lamb-like beast gets its, its power, this entity gets its power from the dragon? So what the Bible is telling us that America would one day become just as the papacy of old. I believe what the Bible say and you see my dear brothers and sisters you have to remember that God's word is true. And when God says that the lamb like beast would speak like a dragon, that's exactly what he meant. And so the verse continues, and he caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed. Is it making any sense now? Let me back up and just summarize for a minute. We see the nations of the world, the Bible predicted, that would rule the world and have an impact on God's plan of salvation. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, papal Rome receiving the deadly wound. This nation that is like a lamb, a lamb-like beast with two horns, coming up out of, into existence just about the time the papal power is coming, going down, and that power is none other than these United States. But the Bible says that one day, it would speak like a dragon, taking on the exact nature, the Bible calls it the image of the beast, the exact nature of the papal power. My dear brothers and sisters, let me give you a, just a quick synopsis of what the papal power is. You see, it's a, basically a secular power. A secular power that seeks worldwide uh, uh, domination, that mixes with all forms of religion, including Christianity, and masquerades as a religious power. But the Bible tells us in reality, it is basically a political power that is seeking world domination, and we shared some of that in more detail previously. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible continues, and he, talking about the United States of America, would do great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth and in the sight of men. And so the Bible is telling us that as America now moves from the position of, of Protestantism, from the position of republicanism, I'm not talking about the Republican Party, I'm talking about the concept of, of, the, of uh, the people being in power to elect there, to have a representative government. The Bible says that this power would become one day like the papacy itself. Jesus, Jesus in the book of Matthew 24 and 24, he says as we come to the end of time, he says that there shall be false Christs and, and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. My dear brothers and sisters, there's a time coming, not too distant, when you're gonna be seeing some miraculous phenomenon, yea, even the false appearing of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us. But Jesus says that if they should say, go here, he is, go not there, for he's not there. Or if they should go say, he's over here, go not there. And the Bible says that unless you are rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, we're talking about the time, in the time of America, there is no other nation that is prophesied to rule this earth after America unites with the papacy. It is going to be the final world power. But I thank God that that's not the end of the story. Because the Bible says, when they think they would have had 
the entire world under their control. Millions murdered that do not go along with what they with, with what they say, who to worship and how to worship. Because that's what the character of the papal power during the dark ages. When the Bible would be taken away, when it would be prohibited from reading the Bible, I just read last week, this school board, I think it's in, in Texas, I don't remember, don't hold me responsible for that, but they removed the Bible from the school, saying that the Bible teaches hate and cruelty. Christianity is practical. It's not just jumping up and, and hallelujah and putting hand and, and all of that. Christianity is a thinking man's religion. Jesus says, come now. Let us reason together. In order for you to reason, you have to have some facts and some details in your head. And Jesus wants us to know exactly what has taken place in these cruel last scenes of Earth's history. Moving right along, we're talking about America, the lamb-like beast. We've already described that. I'm now telling you what the Bible says that it would do. Revelation 13 and verse 14. And deceives them that fell on the earth. Now, who is the father of deception? The Bible just tells us again, let's go back to it. In the book of, uh, of Revelation chapter, chapter um, 12 and verse 9, he says that the dragon deceived the entire world. And then the Bible tells us that he now empowers this entity, you see, to deceive men on the earth. This is what the Bible teaches. And so now John continues. He says that, and he deceives them that dwell on the earth. They can't do anything else but deceive. Uh, because that's the nature. That's the nature of the beast. He's a destroyer. He's a liar. He's a usurper. But his main characteristic is deception. And all of it is being used and will continue to be used upon God's people and the inhabitants of the earth. A saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and, thus, and, and still live. In other words, the Bible is telling us is that the United States of America, I love America, I wasn't born here, but America has been good to me. And this is not talking about any of the ills of America or what you may or may not like about America. I'm talking about the Bible facts that it tells us about America. And it says that they should say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound up by the sword and did live. You see the whole issue is one of worship. And so the Bible is telling us here that America's role, what it will do would be to force men and women to worship the papal power, to worship according to her dictates, and that the center of that worship is Sunday sacredness. As a matter of fact, she says that that's her mark of authority. My dear brothers and sisters, today, as I begin to, to wrap this up, and there is so much more to show the part that America is playing in the prophetic record, we could see it before our very eyes. Is America joining with the papal power and the world to call for Sunday sacredness to save the earth? Yes, they are. Just Google, just go on the papers. Most of your churches, businesses, 
They're all calling for Sunday sacredness to save the earth. The Bible says that they're deceived. I didn't say that. I love you, my brother. I love you, my sister. I love you enough to tell you the truth. This is not hate. This is not condemnation. This is just telling you the truth. And the devil hates the truth. But the Bible tells us that that would be the role of America. It continues in Revelation 13 and 15. And he, America, had the power to give life unto the image of the beast. In other words, if the beast was an amalgamation of church and state, then the Bible says now that America now becomes an image of the beast. So it is now, it has moved from a position of, of religious freedom and, and political openness to one of religious intolerance and ruthless political and civil suppression. My dear brothers and sisters, there are voices now that is telling us one company did a survey. It says that 61% 60, of Americans are saying that they don't want church and state. They want the church to be united with the state again, which is what the founding fathers declared that we will not be. Listen to me this morning, brothers. Listen to the word of God. But the Bible says that one day it would speak like a dragon. And what does the dragon want? Unity of church and state, where the church uses the state to persecute those that will not go along with its dogmas and doctrines. There's a lot more that would probably take a whole session to, to share with you things that are happening in America uh, today. Where men and, are, are going around the country and, and, and just uh, encouraging people. They call it Christian nationalism to bring back the church and the state together. That's what the Bible predicted and that's what we're seeing coming to pass before our, our, our very eyes. The restrictions, they are more by more of, of, of speech. We don't have the freedom of speech like we have. You say the wrong things if you, if you go on certain uh, platforms, they'll take you down for not saying the right thing. If you don't endorse the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, LGBT agenda, you're canceled out. You, 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 you're demonized. We no longer have the freedom of speech as a nation as we used to. It's not totally gone. And that's why I'm taking advantage with the little that we have to share the truth as it is in Jesus. The Bible says that she shall give power and life of image to the beast and the image of the beast shall both speak and cause them that would not worship the beast should be killed. It's an issue of worship. That is what it's all about. Who are you going to worship? The God of creation who says, remember my Sabbath day to keep it holy? Or are you going to worship Satan who is saying through his agency, worship me by honoring Sunday with the deception of on a Sunday because Jesus Christ was raised from the tomb on Sunday. Please, please show me where that is in the Bible. And so my dear brothers and sisters, she says that Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Our deadly wound was healed, and the whole world is wandering after the beast. Am I telling truth, or am I telling lies? How many churches are open today on the Lord's Sabbath day? There are quite a few around the country, around the world. I happen to be part of that communion of Sabbath keepers as a Seventh-day Adventist and a Christian. But you go tomorrow. How many more 
are open and the tens of millions that are coming together supposedly to worship the Lord. But my Bible tells me that Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus would also say, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. My dear brothers and sisters, I could only tell you the truth. And God's word is truth. Jesus says, sanctify them through the truth. That word is truth. And all I'm sharing with you is not my opinion. I have not and will not give you one of my opinion, one iota of my opinion. All I'm giving you is what is written in the word of God and what history testifies to. You can't doubt history. Oh yes, different people may have different opinions or or, or, or concepts of what history was or what have you but ultimately God says that these are the powers that would rule the world and have an impact on God's plan of salvation Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece they're all gone pagan Rome, all gone papal Rome would receive a deadly wound seemingly go out of power but the deadly wound would be healed and all the world wonders after the beast after the, the papal power, then this power, the lamb-like beast with two horns. This is what the Bible says. But the Bible tells me, and I'm going to close with this. Revelation chapter 17. Oh yes. As the world on the, the agent, under the power of the papal power, brings the whole world to worship the dragon, primarily through Sunday sacredness. This is what the Bible says. Revelation 17 and verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Don't take my opinion. Don't even believe the Bible. Just go and do a little secular research and you'll see the location of the papal power or the seven hills of Rome. And Let's go to verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Ten is a complete number in Bible prophecy, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. In other words, they're all going to come together and rule for a very short time. But then, but then the Bible tells us that these all have one mind. Revelation 17 and verse 13 and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Same thing as we read in Revelation 13, the whole world wandering after the beast. But I want to praise God again. I want to praise God again that we need not to fear. We need to trust in Jesus Christ. We need to trust in Jesus Christ for he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. My dear brother, Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jesus Christ, my dear our, our brothers and sisters, he is the branch. Yes. Jesus Christ, he's the rose of Sharon. Yes. Jesus Christ is the one who says, if you love me, keep my commandments. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible now tells us these all, these all shall make war with the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb, but he's not here physically. Those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony and faith of Jesus, that's who they're talking about. Oops. <laughs> these all have one mind and shall give their power strength to the beast. They shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. The battle is stiff. It's going to get more intense. The deadly wound is healed. 
The deadly wound is about to be completely healed as America institutes laws that forces the conscience. That's what the Bible says. Let me share a quick quote with us as we close from my favorite Bible writer, Ellen G. White, in the book uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. She says, by the, the decree enforcing the institution of the pap papacy in violation of the law of God, that is talking about becoming the image of the beast, instituting the mark of the beast, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hands across the ground to grasp the hands of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with spiritualism and honor the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate or abandon every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provisions for the propagation of papal falsehood and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the time is at hand. Let me tell you today, Protestantism, that first hand, has already been surrendered. Republicanism is being steadily attacked. Just read the news. Listen to the Supreme Court rulings. See what is taking place in different states. The republic is being destroyed. That lamb-like beast is beginning more and more to speak like a dragon. But I praise God that Jesus says that he will be the ultimate victor. Both Daniel and John tells us that he would be the one that would come and as Daniel showed us to crush the image of the beast in Daniel chapter 2 my dear brothers and sisters John tells us in Revelation at chapter 20 that he will come and set up his kingdom here on planet earth this is not just a, a story to tickle you it's the reality of life this is why Paul says be ye not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And your mind can only be renewed by the word of God. I pray that someone has been blessed today as we showed clearly from the work of God, from the word of God, that not only that America is mentioned in Bible prophecy which so many theologians deny, but that she is fulfilling her prophetic role right before her eyes. May God help us that we may not be on the side of the beast and the nations, but we will be with, these, with Jesus, for the, for the scripture declares that he will save us. I'm looking forward to that day. I pray that each of you that have listened today, that you would make that determination in your heart that someone has gotten a closer look at God's prophetic word and be prepared to come, be prepared to deal with what is coming upon us right here in America. Father, we thank you. Thank you for speaking with us today, even through this worthless, worthless piece of clay. We pray, dear Lord, that the words that have been shared today, that they have shared nothing but truth. And if they are, dear Father, let them find residence in the ears and the hearts of the hearers. But if not, block their heart, block their ears. Let them not even hear it. And Father, we pray that as we leave this place today, that we all would be drawn a little closer to thee, to be more like Jesus, so that we could be the ones that are on his side. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In Jesus' name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Amen. And amen. amen. God bless. Hymn number 499.